I'm Dwayne Brown. Tonight on KPBS Evening Edition, don't call it a gateway drug. A new study shows what may happen as teens pick up vaping and the health experts calling for strict rules on electronic cigarettes. And why the new so-called pink pill to improve a woman's libido is not like Viagra. I'm Peggy Pico with how the prescription works and possible health concerns. Plus, why the city of San Diego declared a housing emergency for the 12th year in a row and what it's going to take to fix the problem. New evidence, the drought is sinking California, the drive to find water that may leave underground supplies at risk. KPBS Evening Edition starts right now. Hi, good evening. Thanks for joining us. It's one of the toughest programs on the planet. Navy leaders say they plan on opening its elite SEAL team to women who pass the grueling training regimen. We are seeing other branches testing the waters with their training programs, like women training with Marines at Camp Pendleton. Navy Times reports today the head of Naval Special Warfare Command says he believes women should be allowed to serve if they pass the infamous six-month basic underwater demolition and SEAL training. He did not offer a timeline on when women will be allowed into the program. Now, the news from uh, the Navy comes less than 24 hours after Army leaders announced two women have completed challenging combat training and earned the right to wear Ranger tabs on their uniforms. Their graduation ceremony is set for Friday. Punishing off-campus assaults, a bill to expel community college students for sexual assaults that happen off-campus has been sent to Governor Jerry Brown. The bill advanced out of the state legislature with no lawmakers opposed. It extends the disciplinary powers of community colleges to apply to sexual assaults that don't involve other students or happen off campus grounds. Title IX, it's a federal law that requires that action be taken to make sure that college campuses uh, are free of sexual harassment, that uh, there, there is a level playing field, if you will, uh, so that students of both genders have the opportunity to have successful college experiences. That law has been uh, basically ignored. The University of California and California State University systems already permit punishing students for off-campus sexual assault. State lawmakers are considering several other bills increasing consequences for campus sexual assault. Pedestrians crossing the border from Tijuana to San Diego have always had to show their travel documents. Now, Mexico is beefing up inspections of southbound pedestrians. KPBS Fronteras reporter Jean Guerrero has the story. Mexican immigration officials launched a pedestrian customs facility in San Ysidro today. It's called the East Gate. It includes three lanes, one for foreigners, one for Mexicans, and another for visitors who plan to stay in Mexico longer than a week. The building has six inspection booths, where immigration officials will be checking passports. Top U.S. and Mexican officials held a ribbon-cutting ceremony, saying the facility won't lead to long wait times like those going into the U.S. In this facility with separate lines for Mexican and non-Mexican citizens is going to approve efficiency of our shared border and it will expedite travel. Mexican officials say enforcement will be sensitive to the flow of people coming across the border. They say the facility lends dignity to the border crossing process. Customs inspection rules have always been in place here, but now Mexico has the infrastructure to enforce them. Officials say the building will serve more than 20,000 southbound pedestrians a day. Jean Guerrero, KPBS News. Another unexpected consequence of the state's drought emergency, a new NASA report shows groundwater pumping has land sinking at a faster rate. NASA scientists say in some places the ground is sinking nearly two inches a month. They blame it on massive amounts of groundwater pumped during the historic drought. State experts say sinking land is causing costly damage to major canals, delivering water up and down the state. This is another look at the San Joaquin Valley, where NASA says we're seeing the effects. Land sinking has already destroyed thousands of groundwater casings here. Over time, this may reduce the aquifer's storage capacity. 
As dozens of wildfires rage across California, burning homes and businesses, the mayor of Poway is pushing to ban drones near fire scenes. He's proposing to put a two-mile no-drone zone restriction on unmanned aircraft near fires or public emergencies in the city. Firefighters have recently seen their efforts delayed by at least a dozen drones hovering over California wildfires. Poway Mayor Steve Voss says they take public safety seriously. I don't want to look back when we get into Santa Ana season with wildfires blowing all around Poway. I don't want to look back and say, gosh, I wish we'd done something. We're going to make the move now and keep our community safe. Poway is home to General Atomics, a leading manufacturer of drones for the Department of Defense. Voss says he's not trying to tell people what to do in their spare time. He wants to present his plan to Poway City Council next month for a possible vote. A San Diego organization is giving millions of dollars away for projects benefiting low-income communities. Civic San Diego has set aside $83 million for large capital projects to qualify. It must be located near a low-income community or helps the community by creating jobs and services to neighbors. The agency donated $8 million to Urban Core, a job training program. An affordable housing emergency continues in San Diego. Peggy Pico finds out why a decade-old plan to increase housing didn't work and what could help in the future. The average monthly rent for a one-bedroom apartment in San Diego County is $1,582. That's nearly 50 percent higher than the national average. But the high cost of rent is just one reason behind the continuing shortage of affordable housing in our region. Here with more on the problem are my guests, Murderza Baxamusa, director of the San Diego Building Trades Family Housing Corporation, and Chanel Hawken, vice president of public policy for San Diego's Regional Chamber of Commerce. And Murderza, What's the need for affordable housing like today? Well, since 10 years that the state of housing emergency has been declared, boom or bust, rents keep increasing, homelessness increases, and today home ownership is in a state of decline. So that is the reason why we need to do something f to solve the state of emergency in San Diego. Is there a specific number of low or middle income homes that we really would need to fix the problem? 40,000 were projected. 10 years ago, we still have that need today. What are some of the key reasons for this shortage? One of the key reasons for that is we do not build enough of low and moderate income housing. And what we have in terms of the stock we have, rents keep growing up 5 to 10 percent a year, and that keeps pricing families out. That also means there's also a problem of wages. Wages are not able to catch up with the increase in rents that prices families out. And in terms of the homelessness, there is a critical shortage of the need to address, to have that transitional housing and to have the housing that we need to keep the homeless off the street. And Chanel, um, does the business community here see the high cost of housing in San Diego as a problem that needs to be uh, solved? Absolutely. In terms of homelessness downtown, it's gone up 26 percent year over year. Uh, it's a huge priority for our business owners, as well as providing affordable housing for those that are coming into the workforce. We compete against other cities across the nation for talent, and if we're not building enough housing, if we don't have enough housing to make that competitive, then we really lose out as a region. And actually, Tony Atkins is actually trying to address this in a bill, correct? Yes, AB 1335 by Assembly Speaker Atkins will address this. It is a fee, and it will leverage two to three billion dollars in investment for affordable housing. Uh, we hope that San Diego would be able to get a large portion of that and compete successfully for it. And this is something that both of you support. And I want to ask you, uh, Murdozad, though, how the affordable housing shortage actually impacts our local economy. It does. It prices out our local workforce, especially low-wage workers, where you have, for example, over the last year, the, the wages have gone up only 2.8 percent. The housing, the rents have gone up double that. So therefore, people are not able to make ends meet. What you have is a substantial over about over half of all renters pay more than 30 percent of the income on rent, which means they live in unaffordable housing. And Chanel, last year, I know on the same uh, topic here, uh, the City Council passed an ordinance to charge commercial developers a so-called linkage fee Correct. to fund affordable housing developments. How well do you think that plan is working in addressing the uh, affordable housing shortage here? 
Well, I think that it's unfortunately only a drop in the bucket. We have 225,000 households right now that can't afford the average rent or the average price home. So we are working uh, with stakeholders to see what we can do to increase that housing supply. After the recession, we haven't built enough units. So looking at you know, total housing unit cost, 40% of that is due to government regulation. So we'll be working with stakeholders across the county to see if we can get that housing on track, let it let it get done more quickly and more affordably. And where does that, how many housing units uh, do we know that have been built since, uh, since this plan went into effect? Well, because the inclusionary fee is an option to be paid instead of actually building the units, that may not, the question really is, should re developers be required to build 15 or 20 percent and I strongly think that is important in order to have balanced communities for example in downtown where there are a large number of luxury towers being built we're concerned that we're not building an affordable housing stock. Sure now that's different than the linkage fee have you seen an impact from the linkage fee yet? The linkage fee was relatively small uh, probably generated about half a million dollars so far um, maybe that really leverages itself into quite a modest amount of units. It was it was a fee on commercial development. What I'm really referring to is building of the stock itself mm -hmm. by housing developers. Well, let's, let's come back to that because, um, Chanel, what do you think needs to be done to increase affordable housing, the availability, the building all, all across all platforms here to, to improve the situation? Well, I think first off, we have to see where we can build that housing. We want to build it where we can have access to transit and downtown is a perfect place. They have an updated community plan. The residents support dense development and we oppose efforts like AB 504 that would actually make most of the projects downtown, including affordable housing development, uh, appealable to the city council. All right, we are out of time. So uh, Murtaza and Chanel, thank you so much. Thank, thank you. you. Neighbors are still asking questions as the city gets ready to revamp the North Park Business District to make it more friendly to bikes, buses, and pedestrians. Changes are planned for the busy corner of University Avenue and 30th Street. City Council agreed to spend nearly $6 million to revamp a one-mile stretch along Florida and Boundary Streets. Adding new crosswalks and a median, it would also create a new bus lane that can also be used by cyclists. The project survived a challenge to its environmental impact report. Construction won't start until late next year. California's uninsured rate has fallen to a new low. A report from the UCLA Center for Health Policy Research shows almost 14 percent of Californians did not have health coverage last year. The report says enrollment in Medi-Cal has surged since the program expanded eligibility in 2014. In addition, more than half of Californians continue to get coverage from their employer. A new study says teens who use e-cigarettes are more likely than others to later try other tobacco products like conventional cigarettes. The study doesn't prove electronic cigarettes are a gateway drug, but some doctors say it bolsters arguments the devices need to be strictly regulated. The Food and Drug Administration has proposed rules to ban the sale of e-cigarettes to minors and would add the devices to the list of tobacco products it regulates. A San Diego biotech company says it has successfully created new kinds of proteins not found in nature. KPBS science reporter David Wagner explains why that's important. Scientists founded a company called Synthorex last year after they developed two synthetic base pairs of DNA. So natural DNA is made up of four base pairs. You might be familiar with them, A, C, G, and T. Synthrex says they're expanding that genetic alphabet by adding the man-made base pairs X and Y to the mix. CEO Court Turner told me they've produced proteins not found in nature by loading their synthetic DNA into a bacteria. What we've done is we've made the first proteins using Synthrex's unnatural base pairs, which we refer to as X and Y. Now, Synthorec didn't publish work on these new proteins, which they claim function differently from natural proteins. The company is keeping this research proprietary because they hope to use it to develop new drugs based on these new proteins. The journal Science called Synthorex's synthetic DNA one of the year's top breakthroughs in 2014. David Wagner, KPBS News. 
Still buzzing about the little pink pill we first told you about the FDA approval for the drug. To help women with low sexual desire, Sprouts Pharmaceuticals, the company who makes the drug, is still popping the champagne. We just fought the good fight, I think, to get to this moment and open the door um, for women to have options for medical treatment. Viewed as a victory for gender equality, its warning label has drawn controversy. Peggy Pico takes a closer look at the potential health impact. As we first reported Tuesday, clinical trials for FDA-approved Addy, or the so-called pink pill to increase a woman's libido, were done in San Diego. Joining me with how the prescription pill works, health implications, and who should and shouldn't take it are my guests, Dr. Erwin Goldstein, Director of Sexual Medicine at Alvarado Hospital, and marriage and family therapist David Peters. And Dr. Goldstein, you did clinical trials of Addy here in San Diego. Um, how does this so-called pink pill actually work? So we did clinical trials and we found it to be uh, double-blind placebo-controlled. You didn't know how it was going, but then we opened it to, to open label. And then we really got a glimpse of how it worked. It's, and how does it work specifically it, in the body? It stops women from having this horrible condition of no interest. They're not uh, involved. They're not receptive. It changes brain chemistry. It, uh, it, it ch lowers the inhibitors and it raises the excitators, so it rebalances their interest. And so you're talking about this uh, low libido and sexual interest. So specifically medically, you're talking about a certain condition, or are you just talking about women are grumpy and tired and don't want to have sex? Right, so there's a specific definition called HSDD, hypoactive sexual desire disorder. It's persistent and consistent. It's absence of thoughts, fantasies, interest, and responsivity to sexual activity and willing to, willingness to participate, that is, uh, um, causes them bother and distress and partnership distress, and it, doesn't, it can't be explained by an unspecified medical condition. So how much, uh, from this clinical trial, how much can a woman expect her libido or sexual uh, experience to improve? Well, significantly, as such that they're really happy and they're now able to not avoid the event and, and hide and be duty sex. Uh, it's very successful, I have to say. Yeah, I think I read that it involved one uh, improved sexual experience or satisfying sexual experience the, the, a month. The, the, the problem with the term satisfying sexual event is it's a, it's a counting way that was invented by the FDA to, to assess efficacy. When you measure desire by desire scales, it's very effective and far more statistically significant than placebo. Okay, and David, now this pill we were we're talking about changes chemicals in the brain. I understand it, it decreases um, serotonin and it increases dopamine, the pleasure pill. How much of a role does the brain play in sexual desire? Well, the brain plays an enormous role. Sexual desire is experienced in brain function. And uh, for women who truly have hypoactive sexual desire, this can be uh, a great relief and a great joy. Uh, for those, I think my, the key is who truly has hypoactive sexual desire and who may not. Uh, I see a lot of clients coming in who complain about lack of desire and after about five or ten therapy sessions I find there's issues in the relationship, issues in their perception of themselves or the perception of their spouse that are significantly impacting their desire. So uh, the key is accurate diagnosis. This pill is not for everybody who just wants to have better sex. Uh, in our commercial world there's a risk of overselling. Sure. Do you do you see a downside to this, though? And, and my key on this is the serotonin. We know that antidepressant drugs actually raise serotonin levels. So could there be some competition here between depression or other psychological uh, treatments and this prescription? Well, it is interesting that uh, one of the major drawbacks to antidepressants that work on serotonin is raises serotonin levels and wipes out your libido. Now you have something to be depressed about. Uh, but with this medication, it's lowering serotonin levels. And if that allows for increased arousal for a woman who really, under the best circumstances, still doesn't have desire, that's fine. I see. And Dr. Goldstein, uh, what are the major side effects to this pill and who should and shouldn't use it? So drugs that work on the central nervous system tend to have common side effects, somnolence or sleepiness, drowsiness, uh, fatigue, nausea. Uh, very minimal in most uh, of the women experience. Very few people drop out because of side effects. The benefits are so useful. And this is such an amazing opportunity for women to finally get a medical treatment. Sure. So can, can pregnant women, people who have had cancer, it's not a hormone, uh, maybe uh, uh, postmenopausal women, is it open to all women? Well, it's indicated for 
premenopausal women with the HSDD, but we studied it. The FDA required us to study a very large trial in postmenopausal women, and it's safe and effective and very useful in that population. I see, and we're running out of time, David, so I do have to ask you this. Your advice for women who are concerned that their libido or uh, sexual experience is low or not at a healthy level? Yes, well, the key is accurate diagnosis. The assessment has to be thorough. Uh, luckily, in this case, uh, allowing this medication, the FDA has required extensive training for the doctors to assess critically what the need really is. If this were released as many other medications with any general practitioner being able to prescribe, we could be in a lot of trouble. All right, and we have to end on this so very quickly, Dr. Goldstein. Do we know when this is going to be on the market and how October, much it's going to cost? October 17th. Okay. We, I don't know the cost because that's a company decision, but we were told it's roughly what Viagra costs to a Okay, man. October, we'll be looking for that. All right, Dr. Goldstein, family therapist David Peters, thank you so much. Thank you very Good much. Good to be with you. I'm Judy Woodruff on the next news hour. Our presidential running series continues. Gwen Ifill talks with Ohio Governor Republican John Kasich. That's Wednesday on the PBS News Hour. Every year, Hoover High welcomes hundreds of new freshmen. KPBS education reporter Matt Bowler says for the past eight years, the school has operated a special summer day camp giving students what they need to excel. Thank you. Cardinal Camp at Hoover High originally started to help students who might not graduate. This is the first year the program was open to all Hoover freshmen. However, Cardinal Camp is especially beneficial for struggling students. These nervous new ninth graders are getting a jump start on high school. Are you afraid of the work? Well, a little bit. Yes. It gets harder. 14-year-old Emmanuel Juarez Rojas is a little anxious about his first year of high school. About 140 incoming freshmen opted to attend Cardinal Camp. For nine days, students take classes from English to science to Hoover High history, all meant to help them get ready both academically and socially for high school. The shy eighth graders coming in as ninth graders, the boys and girls, it's like, it's mix it up. John Calcott teaches science. Students call him Mr. C. This is his second year teaching at Cardinal Camp. Last year, Mr. C says he really connected with his students. I know that the relationships I built with those kids, it was so much more familiar the first day when they walked in, the first day of class, and like, oh, Mr. C. Today's class is as much about teamwork as it is science. Every group is going to get one of these, and inside every one, this is going to be the boat. This is going to be Fred. Mr. C's holding up a plastic cup a gummy worm, and a lifesaver. In front of you, you have a lab. It's called Safe Red, and it is about procedure. The idea is to put a lifesaver around the middle part of the gummy worm using only paper clips. Right around his midriff section, okay? Without using your hands. The kids are broken up into groups because at Cardinal Camp, learning to work as a team is just as important as the subject matter. I expect all of you to attempt the work and to contribute to your group, um, no matter what level you're at. That's Stephanie Vest. She teaches math. She's been teaching at Cardinal Camp for four years. Um, raise your hand if you like math. Raise your hand if you love math. Raise your hand if you're a math student. Everybody's a math student, so put your hand up. Beth says learning to work cooperatively is especially important for struggling students. What do you do for kids that are, that are just not ready for that standard ninth grade math? Unfortunately, um, or are they just stuck in the class? they're in integrated one or the ninth grade math uh, class integrated one. We don't have a remedial class for them to take. Beth says if an underclassman is good at a subject like math, they should help those who are struggling. I also want them to walk away with um, just collaborative skills, being able to um, clearly communicate their ideas with each other and being a team player. There are the overachievers that come and they're just, they're gonna be rock stars in every discipline. Both Vest and Mr. C expect a lot from their young high schoolers. And at the end of ninth grade, Rojas is expecting much of himself too. Well, right now I'm just like, I just like, you know, normal, you know, go to school, do my work, but at the end, 
I think I'm gonna be more mature. But they're still kids. I'm only half. Only half. Hey, Charlie. They repeat rumors of old gummy worms being passed from class to class and then dare each other to eat them. You better oh. eat it. Oh. Oh. After they finish their project, of course. Matt Bowler, KPBS News. Mild summer weather on tap for San Diego the next few days. We'll see the morning clouds start, then uh, clear back with some sunshine along the coast in the 70s. More of the same inland with temperatures a little warmer in the 80s. Clearing up, though, in the uh, mountains early with temperatures in the 80s. And back to those triple digits if you're in the desert or headed that way. Here's a look at what we're working on for tomorrow in the KPBS Newsroom on Morning Edition, a rare musical occurrence happening in San Diego this weekend. The Russian composer featured at this year's Summerfest Music Festival. And on Midday Edition, new drugs at, uh, aimed at helping people quit smoking are not as successful as hoped. Why is smoking such a tough habit to break? That's tomorrow on KPBS Radio. You can find tonight's stories on our website, kpbs.org slash evening edition. Thanks for joining us. You have a great night.